And then he begins to make some pretty outlandish plans. And they got so mad at Jesus that they jumped up from their seats. They grabbed a hold of him. They thrust him out of the synagogue, out of the city, to the edge of the city. And they were going to throw him off of the cliff there and kill him because of what he said. So my question is, what, what got them so ticked off? What got them so mad? At face value, there's nothing, nothing substantial to get mad about, but at least, uh, and, and, and at least not mad enough to throw Jesus out of the church and threaten to, to throw him off of a hill, off of a cliff. But looking at the context of what Jesus is saying, he was saying there are times that God's people won't listen to the voice of God, but others will. I know it's quiet in here, so, so, so you got to help me out this morning. Now, I apologize. Last week, I preached way too long. When I looked at my clock afterwards, I was horrified. I've been repenting all week, asking the Lord to forgive me. So I'm going to try to make up for it today, right? Smile at your neighbor and say, he's going to be good today. Right? And so, and, and, and so they're so mad. They're so upset. They're so enraged at the words that Jesus was saying that they thrust him out of church and thrust him. They would have killed him if they could, but he just walked, he walked past them. And so what he was saying is there are times that God's people won't listen to the voice of God while other people will. Sometimes people think that we have a, not, a monopoly on what God is doing. The reality is we don't. Uh, no, I appreciate the fact that we preach the truth. We're one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy rolling, uh, believers in the liberating power of Jesus' name. We, we have the truth. We're preaching the truth. But the reality is we're not the only church where God moves. That's right. That's the plan. You know, and not to, to, I don't want to, you know, upset anybody by what I'm going to say next, but I know people who are in Catholic churches that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost yeah. and they're baptized in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank Amen. you, Lord. Hallelujah. And so we don't have a monopoly on what God does. Amen. In fact, we don't even have a monopoly on the truth because there's a lot of churches that preach truth. It's not just a United Pentecostal Church International, and I'm thankful for it, but there's a lot of apostolic truth teaching churches. So here they are, they're Jews of the temple, they're on, it's on the Sabbath day. Like us today, here we're, we're in church on Sunday, and we expect God will show up and talk to us. We expect that. So Jesus got the people in the synagogue so mad they wanted to kill him. So let's look at it again. In Luke chapter 4, verse 25, it says, Certainly, there were many needy widows, uh, widows, again, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Certainly, there were many needy wid widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and severe famine was devastating the land. So he was saying there were widows in Israel in Elijah's day, and then he goes further. In verse 26, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to, notice this, a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Right. All of a sudden, now they're, they're, their pride is starting to peak. Right. And they're, they're trying to say, okay, what are you saying now? All right? There, there's widows all over Israel, but God didn't send the man of God to them. He sent them to this heathen lady, heathen land, to a heathen lady, and, and she was the one that was getting ministered to. She was the one that was going to get a miracle. Amen. And their, their, their righteous indignation was, was peaking at that point, and they were like, okay, now, what are you saying? But God didn't send his servant Elijah to them. And then he goes on, and then in Elisha's day, in Luke chapter 4, verse 27, and there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, but only one, one healed named Naaman the Syrian. Look at uh, the next verses, starting at 20, 28, it says, when they heard this, the people in the synagogue were so furious Jumping up, they mobbed him. They forced him to the edge of the hill. 
on which the town was built, they intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. They would have killed him that day. And again, I ask you, what infuriated them so much? In, in Romans 9 and verse 15, God says, For he said unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it goes on to say in Romans chapter 9 verse 16, So that it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but God will show mercy. Are you still with me so far? So it's not just to them that want it, nor is it to them that think they deserve it per se. But God will have mercy on anyone that he wants to have mercy. He will heal anyone that he wants to heal. If you've been in, each, in church any time at all, you will understand this. Sooner or later, you will be surprised at what God does. Yes. In fact, the longer you've been in the church, you're going to be surprised at what God does. Because we come to church and we are supposedly righteous living for God, doing our best, trying to live a holy life, trying to be obedient to God. And sometimes we come to church and we don't feel the presence of God, but somebody comes brand new walking through the door and they're loving and worshiping God. And sometimes we'll look over and say, Jesus, that's not fair. You just filled them with the Holy Ghost, but I didn't feel your spirit all service long. Now whose fault is that? I would be chewing that for a little while. In a church service, God fills somebody with the spirit. You wonder, did they really repent? It, does their life really line up with the way that it should be for God to, to give them their miracle? I, I think there's a tendency for us to think that God owes us. All right, are you still here? There's a tendency for us to think that God owes us. We put in our time. We've given our tithes and our offerings. We've done everything that we're supposed to do, but yet other people are blessed. Now, that is not true all the time, but what I'm saying is we've got to be careful not to get that, that spirit of envy that comes on us. When God wants to bless somebody, we shouldn't be thinking, well, you know what? I deserve that, too. We ought to rejoice with them that are rejoicing and weep with them that are weeping. So if, because we are part of the family of God, because we are a part of his church, when your brother or your sister is blessed, you're blessed also. So we don't, we don't give to get, and we don't serve to gain his favor. We do things for God because we love him. And because we want to serve him and give our best to him. We don't do things for God to twist his arm and to somehow get things from the Lord. I, I think of Zacchaeus. Jesus went to eat at Zacchaeus' house and it offended the religious elite. The, uh, the, then in, in, a, in, in the same time frame, when a former prostitute breaks a bottle of precious ointment of oil and anoints Jesus and the religious snobs of the day were looking and saying, if this man were really a prophet, if this man talking about Jesus were really a man of God, he'd know who it is who is touching him. And, 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 and so, so what happens is sometimes the religious get too religious. And so instead of seeking God, we start seeking the things of God. Right. And there is a difference, by the way. Yes, now, I'm grateful you're here. You're obedient to the word of God. We're here to worship the Lord. We're here to love God. But it's really deeper than that is. Yes. And so in, when that prostitute broke open that alabaster box of ointment and anointed him, people were looking.
He had to explain she's anointing me for my burial. That's another message in and of itself. I, I wonder if any of you have ever done a, a word study. I like doing word studies in the Bible. It, it's enjoyable. I did a word, word study some time ago about the word vain. The word vain. V-A-I-N. Vain in the word of God means empty. Now remember, what kind of empty are you is our message today. Vain means empty. The Bible gives us references like uh, vain obviously being empty. It talks about vain conversation. You know, just talking about things that just have no real meaning or use. Vain envy. Uh, vain empty religion is referred to in the Bible. Vain questions. Vain genealogies. Uh, uh, you know, trying to trace back to see if you were related to Moses or not. And, 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 and uh, vain talkers and vain deceivers, the Bible refers to. It talks about vain babblings, vain talk, vain work, vain deceit, vain empty traditions, uh, vain or, or again. But when I say vain, I'm talking about empty, empty words, empty labor. Uh, we labor in vain, the Bible says. We run in vain. Uh, we, the, there's talks about vain boasting and vain empty faith and vain imaginations. These are just some of the things that talks about vain empty worship and then vain empty re repetitious prayer. Well, I'm thinking about that for just a moment. I think we need to somehow change our prayer time to always thinking we got to ask God for things. Now, the Bible does say, you know, you, you, uh, you have not because you ask God. I understand that. But sometimes we're just asking for the wrong things. They, uh, the, the thing be about being, being vain, uh, you know, prayer or, or, or prayer that just doesn't seem to do anything is because it's more about giving God a laundry list of the things that we need or want uh, rather than trying to have a relationship with him. I submit to you this morning that if you seek a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, everything else will take care of itself. Those things that I just mentioned, mentioned to you about the vain repetitious prayer and empty worship, those are just some of the things that are referred to in the New Testament. So this morning I want you to understand this. There are two kinds of empty. The first empty is a useless empty. The second empty is a useful empty. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But thankfully, to the best of my knowledge, let me ask this question. How many of you have ever run out of gas in your car? Okay. Do you know why you ran out of gas? Because you didn't fill it up. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, I've never run out of gas. I've gotten really full sometimes. All right. But when I, I start freaking out when it goes under a quarter tank, I start looking for the gas station. When it, when it gets around an eighth of a tank, you know, I, I'm, I'm really like, okay, we got to stop. We have to stop now. And, and so for those of you that forget to look at your gauge, God bless you. But there, that gauge is there for a reason. And, and let me add to this without hurting anybody's feeling when that red light's come, come on to where the needle is down to empty and that red light comes on, that's Christmas lights. You can just blow it up. <laughs> and so, so thankfully, to the best of my knowledge, I've never run it. Now, now, there have been a couple of times where my vehicle wouldn't start because the fuel pump was not working or, or something like that. But... I don't believe, uh, in fact, I'm tr I was trying to rack my brain earlier, I don't believe I've ever run out. I've gotten really close to it. So there's two kinds of empty. The first is a useless kind of empty, talking about the context that we're preaching on this morning. The second is a useful empty. The useless empty is kind of like a cloud without rain. It's there, but it's not doing anything. The useful empty is like being empty but willing to be filled. So my question is, what kind of empty are you? Amen. Paul says in, uh, to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Notice what he says, but I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection, Lest that 
so run, not as uncertainly. Certainly. So what he's saying is, if I'm running this race, I've got a target in mind. I've got a direction that I'm going. Now, I am not a person that likes marathons, at least running in them. And I know they're going to be having the Manchester, Manchester Road Race in, in, uh, on Thanksgiving Day, and if you're able to run it, God bless you, I'm not going to run it. <laughs> but what Paul is saying is I run, but I run with a purpose. Are, are you still with me? Yeah. He's saying I run, but I run with a purpose. And then he says I fight. But I'm not fighting as one that is just beating the air. That's right. If you have ever watched a boxing match, you there's one thing that is very important to understand. When a, two people are fighting or they are boxing and somebody is constantly missing his opponent, he is using up more energy by missing than he would by hitting. Right. And so he or she would get tired faster because they're fighting, but they're fighting the air. They're not doing anything. They're not connecting. They're not accomplishing anything. And so Paul says, I run, but not with uncertainty. I fight, not as one that beateth the air. But then he goes on, I keep my body under subjection. I, I, in other words, I am not going to let the, my body win this. Uh, my body is going to be kept yeah. under su subjection. Yeah. Then he goes on, lest by any means that I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's saying, I don't want to preach to others and in the end lose my soul. That's exactly what he's saying. And I'd like to echo that today. I don't want to get so used to serving God that I forget to have a relationship with God. We can get so wrapped up in doing the mechanics. You know, teaching the Sunday school class and greeting people and vacuuming the church yeah. and cleaning the carpet and, and, and folding the, the uh, you know, the bulletin, uh, the bulletins and doing the sound system and, and doing all the stuff that makes up part of what the church is all about. We can, we can get so wrapped up in doing things that we don't have time to talk to Jesus and Jesus doesn't have time to talk to us. So people who are full of themselves, they won't listen to God. And I want to say this to somebody. I feel like the Lord has me pin this down. Is don't ever limit God. Even a quick look at the Bible shows us that those who come to God empty are filled. And those who come to God full end up leaving empty. There are, in the Bible, there are empty vessels and empty pits and empty years, empty souls, empty nets, empty houses, empty barrels. Uh, it, I think it is. God touches the public and the sinner over the self-righteous Pharisee. We see that in the Bible. God touches a desperate Hannah when a backslidden priest by the name of Eli thinks that she's drunk. God can't help a rich young ruler when he refuses to put God first in his life. We see in the New Testament, Jesus notices a widow woman who gave her last penny over the people that were walking in and giving huge offerings into the temple. But Jesus is standing off the side and he looks at that lady and he looks at his disciples and he whispers to them and says, you see that lady over there? She gave a couple of pennies, but she has given more than all the rest. Uh, but yet there were rich people that were walking in. Their servants were walking in with baskets and baskets of, uh, of produce and offerings that they were going to give to the Lord. Uh, and she walks in and very sheepishly she just puts in her couple little pennies. And Jesus says she gave more, gave more than all the rest. Uh, because she gave out of her want, uh, but they gave out of their abundance the Bible tells us uh, amen I want to come to the Lord empty so that he can fill me I want to come to the house on Sunday morning the house of God and I want to be empty so Jesus can pour into me I don't want to come full I want to come empty and say here I am Lord I'm an empty vessel I want you to pour into my life amen it's empty that God loves to be able to fill in 1 Corinthians 
Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. It says, for you see your calling, brethren. Notice what he says here. This is important. Paul is saying to the church in, in Corinth, how that not many wise people after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The base things of the world and things that are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to not, to not the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. I, I don't know why I'm going to say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. I, I remember being in a service sometime in the last two or three years, and whether it was in Connecticut, uh, none of your business. And, and I, I was in that service. It wasn't our church. It was another church. And they had all the preachers stay outside, and the worship was going on, and the service was going on. And then after two or three songs were sung, all of a sudden someone got up into a microphone and started welcoming all the preachers into the room. And they started calling people by name, bishop so-and-so, and pastor so-and-so, and evangelist so-and-so, and and this and that, and there was probably about 40 preachers that were there, and I was there as a visitor, and they, they took my name down, they said, we want you to wait out here with everybody else, and it, it, I, I have to be honest with you, I was so extremely uncomfortable, because it was about who people were, and what they did, or what they were, the pastors they were, the evangelists that they were, and as, as we're walking in, people are clapping, and and whistling and shouting and, and, and giving honor to human flesh, to men and women. And the Bible does say to give honor to whom honor is due. But it doesn't for one time tell you you ought to worship a preacher or you ought to worship an evangelist. It doesn't say that. And so any time that the church honors me, I'm always feeling antsy about it because I know that I'm not worthy of it. I know this about myself. I'm an empty vessel that needs God. That's the most important thing you can know about me. I'm an empty vessel that needs God. I am nothing but Jesus is everything. Is that okay to say? And so I want to ask you this question. Have you ever wondered why God chose you? Think about it for a moment. You know yourself, don't you? You, you know your mess-ups? Right? You know your fears? You know how many times you know what Jesus said to do and you didn't do? You know what the Bible says to do and you didn't do it? Or am I, am I on left field somewhere? You understand what I'm talking about? You know yourself. And you know all of the things that you don't want, that want other people to know. None of us would love to have all of the junk that we've done displayed on the board at church. Right? Displayed on the back wall for everybody to see. Oh, she did this, and she did that, and he did this. And he, not one person in this room, room would want that. But I want you to know that God called you. He is calling you. He has called you, and he is calling you. It's not, listen, I'm not saying that God ignores our sin and failures. He doesn't. Every one of us needs to repent and get right with God in time. And so it's not that he's ignoring our failures and he's ignoring the things that we've done wrong, but he's looking at them through his blood. He's looking at us through his blood, knowing us, that, hey, I can take that woman, I can take that man, and I can make something out of them. Amen. He wants us to come to him empty so that we can be filled. He didn't call you because you were beautiful. He didn't call you because you were handsome. He didn't call you because you had money. He didn't call you because you had a great education. He didn't call you because you're smart. He called you because he loves you. And so I, 
shows me I, I, I really don't have anything good in my opinion to offer him. So why did God send Elijah to a heathen, to a heathen city, to a wilderness? I'm going to kind of give you the Cliff Notes version of this. Uh, uh, I didn't give the note, the, the key scriptures to Sam, but in First First Kings chapter thir uh, seventeen, I'm sorry, uh, talking about how that Elisha went to a heathen city to a widow woman, starting in verse ten. Again, I'm just going to kind of give you the Cliff Notes version. The Bible tells us that he went to Zarephath, and there was a widow, widow woman there that was gathering two sticks. One translation, or it, it says sticks, but one translation says she was gathering two sticks. He said to that woman, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And then he asked her for some bread. She turns around and says, I only have enough bread for my son and I so that we can eat our last meal and die. Elijah looks at her, says, fear not, make me therefore a little cake first. And bring it to me, and after, make for thee and thy son. Some people look at that and say, how rude. The man of God, Elijah, this was her last meal, and he's asking for part of her last meal. But there was a connection to it that I want to get into. So Elijah said, said unto her, fear not, make, for, make me a... Therefore, a little cake first and bring it to me. And then after that, make for thee and thy son. And so she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, the Bible tells us. And she and he and her household, the Bible says, did eat many cakes. I'm going to go a little bit further in a moment. But all she had was a little bit of meal in a barrel. And a little bit of oil, just enough to make one meal. And out of obedience to the man of God, she makes him a little cake first and then makes for her and her son. But something happened. After she made for him, she had enough to make for her and her son. But the Bible says not just her and her son, but her whole household. So a miracle happened the moment she obeyed God. The Bible tells us that the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah, uh, which spake by Elijah. So why didn't God send Elijah, or why did he send Elijah to a, a, a heathen city to a widow woman? She had nothing to offer. She was poor. She was penniless. She didn't even have enough, enough food to last a whole day, gathering two sticks to make a little fire to cook a little meal. Why did God send Elijah to that lady? She was willing to get what little she had out of obedience. We can always bring something. It might be empty in the world's eyes, uh, but as far as God is concerned, he can always use what little we have. And God was willing to receive that offering, and it was received as worship. And, and, and as you study, and again, I know I didn't get into, into detail here, but the barrel every day, you know, I, I've studied this. I've thought about it many times. Every day that lady went to that barrel, and God did not fill the barrel. Now, um, we, we have a multicultural church. Yeah. And so a lot of you eat rice. Yeah. A lot of rice. Yeah. All the time rice. Yeah. Well, almost all the time rice. Yeah. Nothing against that. Rice, rice can be awesome. Yeah. All right? Some of you from the islands, you like oxtail. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a long time to try that. Because I was thinking about the end of the animal it was from. And so I was not intrigued by it a whole lot. And so culturally, some of you will eat a lot of pasta or a lot of bread. Culturally, some of you will eat a lot 
of rice. And so when we get, go to the store to get rice, we get a little box of rice. Some of you, when you go to the store to get rice, you get a big bag of rice. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so think about that big bag of rice, and all you have in the bottom of that bag of rice is enough to make one meal. The Bible doesn't tell us that, that God ever filled that barrel. I feel, I feel it like this, that every day she got there, she was surprised that there was more in the barrel. So think of it like this for those of you that are, you know, have those big 20-pound bags of rice. You, get, you, you, you emptied it out yesterday, but you get there today, and it's still got more in it. And you empty it out again, and the next day you come, it's got more in it. Where did it come from? The barrel didn't produce it. The bag didn't produce it. God produced it. And so every day she came, there was more in the barrel. I don't know when God multiplied it. I don't know how he multiplied it. I just know that when she got there, the, bar the barrel had more in it, and the cruise of oil had more in it. And for many days, the Bible says. I, I studied it out some time ago, and, and I can't remember the exact figures, but I believe it was close to a year that she kept coming back and more food every single day, more meal in the barrel, and there was more, more uh, oil in the cruise. And every single day she came back, there was more. She didn't deserve it. She came to God empty. All she had was two sticks and a little meal. And she made him basically what amounted probably to a couple of mouthful worth of food. Uh, she gave it to the man of God out of obedience. Uh, and if it wasn't for that, she would have died. Uh, so a short time later, her and her son. Uh, I studied this some time ago that, that uh, when... When it talks about her and her whole family were able to survive for many days, uh, she actually called in her family from around the city and invited them into her house. Uh, so not only was it just her and her son anymore and the man of God, uh, but her cousins were there and her nieces and nephews were there and her grandmother and grandfather were there. She brought them all in and somehow the provision that God did uh, out of multiplying was was able to fill her, fill her whole house for a long period of time. But she came to God with me. And every day there was more food. It was just, you look there, there was like nothing there. You wondered how the miracle would even come to pass. And so every day it looked like it was her last meal. And, and, and I'm, I, I hope I'm preaching to somebody today. I'm asking you this question. What kind of empty? In Philippians 2, 5 and 8, again, I'm watching the clock. The, the Philippians 2, uh, 5 and 8, it says, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But notice this, verse 7, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled, talk, about, talk to your neighbor for a second, and say he humbled himself. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. People of that day expected Messiah to come and to be a, a, a kingly type ruler that was going to take them out of Roman, uh, out of servanthood to the Roman army and the Roman nation, uh, uh, out of being slaves to the Romans. Uh, that's what they wanted. They didn't really want a savior. They wanted some that was going to someone that was going to take them out of Roman occupation. But he didn't come as that kind of a king. Uh, he came a, came as the king of kings uh, and the Lord of lords. He came as the great I am, uh, but he came as a servant. Uh, he didn't come to be their master. He came there to be their savior and their healer and their friend. Uh, he came when you looked at him, the Bible said, you would look at him and there was nothing attractive about him. That's what the Bible says. In fact, in some places in the New Testament, it tells us that they were offended by why were they offended by Jesus? Because he wasn't what they expected. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He wasn't what they expected. And it's 
expect their Savior to come and sleep on the dirt. They didn't expect their Savior to, you know, instead of going to Urban Urban Graduate School to get all the get all the people that are going to be a part of your closest twelve that are going to serve you and work with you. He got fishermen. He got people that stank like stank like fish. There were nothing people of that. In fact, even the Bible tells us when they looked at the disciples, they called them unlearned and ignorant men. They didn't go to Harvard. He didn't go to Harvard to look for his disciples. He looked for somebody that was going to listen to him and not tell him. That's right. His idea of coming was as a king was to be a servant, a healer, a savior. He came to give his life, the Bible says, a ransom for their souls, not to deliver them from the Roman occupation. And so I'm going to say a few more things this morning. I want to remind you that you don't have to get good to get God. That's right. And I, I don't know everybody here uh, you know, intimately or deeply in that sense. But sometimes when we when people come to church, I've literally had people come or have people call me and say, I'm interested in coming to church, but I've got to try to get right with God first. I've got to change some things first. Uh, and, and I try to do it as timely as I can because I know they haven't come yet. And, and, and haven't come to church yet. So so I'll, I'll say to them, listen, if, if you wait to get right, if you wait to change all that stuff in your life, it's never going to happen. You don't come to church because you're right. You come to church because you need to get right. And so I just try to encourage them. They say, well, well, what, you, you know, I don't have a dress to wear. Who cares? You don't have to come to church in a dress. Uh, if all you have is slacks, then put slacks on and come to church. Uh, listen, we're, you know, yes, we do preach holiness. We preach, uh, you know, a separate lifestyle. Yes, we do that. Uh, amen. But the fact is that these doors need to be open to anyone that has to come in and ask to come in. So you don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. You, uh, the bottom line is this. Just come as you are because if you will come as you are, empty and lost and undone, uh, he is the one that's going to fill you. He's the one that's going to change you. And while I'm at it, the preacher isn't going to change you. And the choir isn't going to change you. And the worship leader isn't going to change you. And the Sunday school teacher is not going to change you. Only Jesus can change you. Now, this might, might hopefully stir somebody up. You don't have to do anything to be loved by God. You don't have to do anything to be loved by God. He loved you and he loves you. He, he loves you even before you, you even thought about serving him. He loved you. Even before, before you were formed in your mother's womb, he loved you. So you don't have to do anything to be loved by God. He already loves you. You know, I, I keep mentioning my little grin buddy. And uh, he's really cool. And just for the one, all kinds of fun and all kinds of trouble. <laughs> he is a bundle of trouble. So he'll look, he'll come and he'll see his arms come over and he'll grab my keys and I'll go, no, that's going to hurt, that's not him. He'll grab my glasses, no, that's going to hurt, that's not him. If I have a glass of iced tea or something there, he'll try to grab it, but no, that's going to hurt, that's not him. And so he, he is always, he's exploring. Our house is not used to being Kid friendly. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Our house is, you know, we got stuff we don't want to touch. He started getting. 
because we have had to take everything out of there to put it somewhere else. And so our house is steadily becoming a mess because we are trying to compensate for his grubby little hands. And so right in the center of the huts, we've got those three drawers. I had to get some wooden dowels to put it down through the handles and wire tie it to those handles so he can't open it anymore. <laughs> we had to just install these little kid device things that, that you know, he can't open that cabinet anymore. And, and to open that cabinet, we have this little magnet thing. You've got to stick there where I've installed the thing so that the little lever will flip down so that you can open it yourself. We're, we're, we're having to compensate for his curiosity. And so although he is frustrating, I love him just because he's my grandbaby. And he's irritating. I'm even getting to love this dog. And so the thing, going back to my grandson, is he doesn't even have to do anything for me to love him because he's my grandson. And though he's irritating, I still love him. And although he's frustrating, I still love him. And although I'm having to kid proof the house, I still love him. Well, you know what? Before you were ever born, God loved you. And every time you mess up, he still loves you. Now, he wants you to stop messing up. But he still loves you. And he still, if he had to die again, he would die again because he loves you that much. And, and so you don't have to do anything to be loved by God. He already loves you. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 from the New King James Version, it says, But God demonstrate, demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. that some of you think I have nothing to offer God yes you do you might not be able to play the drums or the keyboard but he loves you you don't have to have certain talents and abilities I'm always amazed years ago I used to play the drums I don't play the drums anymore I was never really good at it but you know, I listen to people like Micah play the drums or the Brown son play the drums and I'm thinking like I was an embarrassment when I played the drums because they're so talented. I remember a few years back more than that, that we had a preacher that came and he did a uh, if I remember in a Christmas concert course, and he played he played the saxophone.
concert for us. He starts playing two saxophones. I'm thinking like best is time, right? For God to give you all the talents and not to give me any. Thank you. 